1 Samuel 13, 1-4, Saul selected 3,000 soldiers to fight the Philistines, and his son Jonathan led 1,000 of them. And it tells us in verse 3 that Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. All Israel heard the news that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become odious to the Philistines. The people were then summoned to Saul at Gilgal. Now the Philistines mobilized their troops to fight Israel. They assembled the fighting, to fight Israel with 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And when the men of Israel, verse 6, saw that they were in a strait, for the people were hard-pressed, and the people hid themselves in caves and thickets and cliffs and cellars and in pits. Also, some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan in the land of Gad and Gilead. But as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He went to Gilgal because that's where Samuel had told him to go. So Saul waited for Samuel at Gilgal. He was not to go into battle or do anything until Samuel arrived. But the people are scared and beginning to leave. So now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So what do you do? If you're Saul, you need a sacrifice before you go into battle. Samuel's not there. What do you do? You ought to wait. But he offers it. It's a red flag. So Saul said, bring to me the burnt offering, verse 9, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. No conscience. I mean, it's no guilt in him. But Samuel said, what have you done? Now, here's what we want to watch of Saul. When Saul's told he's done wrong, he never admits it. And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, and you did not come within the appointed days, and the sun hadn't set yet, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. And I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. I had to do it. It's your fault. You weren't here. 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which He commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. This gets gradual. Right now it won't endure. Later it won't even exist. The Lord has sought out for Himself a man after His own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over His people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So the Israelites' fear of the Philistines clearly show that they're failing to trust the Lord. They're afraid, even though the Lord had fought for them in the past. Saul waited at Gilgal in obedience to Samuel's orders back in 1 Samuel 10.8. We didn't read that earlier as so we were just running through. But Samuel said to Saul, And you shall go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. But he didn't wait long enough. Minds as of the Israelites foot of Mount Sinai. People began to leave Saul. People were fleeing. People were fleeing. 1 Samuel 13, 9, Saul was unwilling to wait the full seven days and overconfidently offer the sacrifice that he was not authorized to offer. Because as soon as he finished, here came Samuel. When Samuel arrived at Gilgal, he confronted Saul. And Saul's refrain is, I take full responsibility, but none of it is my fault. 1 Samuel 13.10, offering the sacrifice was right, but Saul did it in the wrong way, thereby showing a level of unbelief and disobedience to God. And it's going to get worse. 1 Samuel 13.11, Saul offered three excuses for his actions. The people were leaving, Samuel was late, the Philistines were coming. What else could I do? Verse 12, Saul rationalized his disobedience and justified his actions in his own mind. Self-justification. An arrogant skill that leads to self-deception and more self-absorption. 
1 Samuel 13, 13 to 14, Samuel rebuked Saul for being foolish and informed him that his kingdom would not endure forever. It would be given to David, a man after God's own heart. Now, verses 15 through 23, we have a lack of swords, spears, and men placed Israel at a grave disadvantage. They don't have any swords because there's no blacksmiths. This was arms control of the ancient world. Kept Keep them from having blacksmiths, you can't make the swords. Keeps them from having the latest technology. So they had to use their plowshares and their mattocks and their axes and their hoes. 1 Samuel 14, 1-10, Jonathan met the Israelites' fear of the Philistines with faith and marched into their camp with courage. In verse 6, then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. His armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, turn yourself, and here I am with you according to your desire. And Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has given them into our hands, and this shall be the sign to us. 11 through 16, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed 20 Philistines. And God frightened the enemy with an earthquake, causing them to retreat. Verse 12, so the men of the garrison held Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Verse 14, that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half a furrow and an acre of land. So we are introduced to Jonathan who is a man of valor. He's going to be David's best friend. And he's the son of Saul. He's going to have a better perspective than Saul does. 17 through 23, because of the victory provided by God, the Israelite deserters returned to the army and pursued the enemy. They were emboldened as a result. And so in verse 23, the Lord delivered Israel that day, and the battle spread beyond Beth Haven. 24 through 26, Saul's arrogance surfaced again when his foolish command that deprived his soldiers of much needed food. Now the men of Israel, verse 24, were hard pressed on that day, for Saul had put the people under oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening, and until I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. All the people of the land entered the forest, and there was honey on the ground. When the people entered the forest, behold, there was a flow of honey, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But, Jonathan recognized the need for nourishment during and after battle. Jonathan had not heard when his father put the people under oath. Therefore, he put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. It it nourished him just as it would have nourished the other soldiers. But Saul's dumb oath had kept them from eating. And they're going to be so famished that they end up violating a clear command from Scripture. 31 through 32, Saul's foolish command starved the soldiers into violating one of God's commands. They struck among the Philistines the day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very weary. The people rushed greedily upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. They eat them raw right there with the blood pulsating, which God had said not to do. And Saul hears about it. He does what big government does. He has a control factor. Watch what happens. And Saul was told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he said, You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Each one of you bring his ox or his sheep and slaughter it here and eat. In other words, government control. I'm going to see you kill it. I'm going to see you eat it properly. And it was all because he had told them not to take anything to eat. Saul attempted to solve the problem he had created by another foolish command. What's worse is his son has violated the oath he didn't know about. Saul built an altar and sought the Lord's guidance regarding going into battle against the Philistines. Verse 35, Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he had built to the Lord. Kind of gives us an idea. 
of his dedication. Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and take spoil among them until the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. So the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him on that day. Silence before God. God is moving out of dealing with Saul. It's going to get worse as time goes on. 38 through 42, Saul was determined to discover the sinner and cast lots, which indicated his son Jonathan's guilt. That is, the one who had eaten the honey under the oath or under the ban. And he's going to have to kill his son Jonathan. It fell on Jonathan. Jonathan was taken. Verse 43 through 45, the people knew Jonathan was not guilty of any sin, requested that he be allowed to live. Verse 45, the people said to Saul, Must Jonathan die, who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. 46 through 52, God granted military victory in spite of Saul's personal decline. They continue to have to fight, though, but they do have military victory. Then we come to the key chapter in, as far as Saul is concerned with chapter 15 with the Amalekites. Verses 1 and 2, Israel battled the Amalekites because of their past attacks on Israel. This, this is the group that attacked them during that time when uh, Moses would have his hands up and they would be having victory and so the Lord says this in verse 2 thus says the Lord of hosts I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt verse 3 now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all watch that word all that he has and do not spare him that is the king as well but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Everything. This is important. God commanded Israel to completely destroy the Amalekites. But what's going to happen? Verses 5 and 6. Because the Kenites were descendants of Moses, his father-in-law, Israel warned them to leave the Amalekites. So they give a warning to the Kenites to get out of there. So, verse 7, Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless they utterly destroyed. That's not what God said. God said destroy all. But they only destroyed what they wanted to destroy. Excuse me. Saul disobeyed God's command to utterly destroy everything, instead allowing King Agag and the best of the animals to live. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel cares for Saul. And he's concerned. Praise the Lord all night long. Samuel was hurt by the news of Saul's disobedience and went to give him God's message. Now Samuel came to Saul. He was told Saul that Samuel was coming up. So he came and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Last time I checked, Dead sheep don't bleat. So how can you have carried out the full command of the Lord? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we've utterly destroyed. Sounds like some confessions I get from my kids sometimes. <laughs> it does. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And Saul said, Speak, God be good about me. Samuel said, Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel? 
And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated? Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and had brought back Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. He doesn't get it. He just does not get it. Verse 13, Saul operated in self-deception as evidenced by his claim to have obeyed the Lord. Self-deception. Verse 14, Samuel's reply to Saul was full of sarcasm. How come I hear these oxen? What are they doing walking around if they're dead? Weird dead oxen. Verse 15, Saul attempted to cover up his disobedience by placing the blame elsewhere. Seems like we've seen that before. Man's been doing that since he ate the fruit. That's what we saw yesterday. Verses 16 through 19, Samuel did not accept Saul's justification for his disobedience. Verses 20, 21. Saul still tried to justify his actions and blame others. And then Samuel said to him, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Now the Lord had put forth the sacrifices. He had established it. But he had obeyed in the wrong way. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, which Saul will be into later. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. So verses 22 and 23, Samuel did not reject the idea of sacrifice. Saul's error was in offering the sacrifice in disobedience. Verse 24, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Oh, whoa, that, this might be good. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Still not really my fault though, see, it's because I listened to them. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. Now, I've got to think about this for a moment. It's not like he's wearing a shower cap type robe. This would be a thick garment. And so for it to tear, to me, I think what this is, he seizes Samuel, and, almost, and he tries to rip him back in anger, and the robe tears. It's not, it should not be an easy tearing thing. And then Samuel uses it as a teaching moment. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. 24-25, Saul admitted sin but placed the blame on the people, not on himself. He's still passing the buck. 26 through 29, Samuel used the tearing of his robe as a teaching tool to illustrate God's removal of the kingdom from Saul. <clears throat> but watch what Saul says after that. Then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. I mean, All right, I was wrong, but come on now. Just get over it. Let's go celebrate. Verses 30 through 35, Samuel returned with Saul to carry out God's command, but then left Saul and grieved over his disobedience. So Samuel went back following Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. He finished the job. 
And then we don't see Samuel and Saul together anymore. 1 Samuel 16 to 17, Samuel anointed David king. And God verified David's appointment through his defeat of Goliath. Once David gets anointed king, chapter 17 is the largest chapter in 1 Samuel. And it verifies David as the anointed one. God instructed Samuel to anoint a son of Jesse as king of Israel. He tells Samuel to go to Bethlehem and anoint one of Jesse's sons. Samuel says, what if Saul hears of this? He says, let's go there to sacrifice and do it. And then when, they, when Samuel comes to town, they ask him, you come in peace? A lot of times when the prophet came, something bad was up. You know, it was kind of bring judgment. So they, are you coming with some good news? And he was coming with some good news. And he goes to Jesse's house. And 6 through 10, God taught Samuel the danger of evaluating anyone by outward appearance. He says, I want to see your sons. And Eliab's brought in. Samuel looks at him, wow, this guy's got all his teeth. And I mean, he looks good. This must be the Lord's anointed. The Lord says, don't look on the outer appearance, for the Lord looks on the heart. He's not the one. Brings in the other sons. Still not the one. It's the boy that's out with the sheep. Look at verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And then Samuel anointed David king, and then traveled to Ramah. And when he anointed him, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And you look at verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. The Lord allows this to take place. So as soon as the Holy Spirit comes on David, it had left Saul. There's those two verses go together. 14 through 23, only David's music could bring Saul relief. David plays the harp for King Saul and it gives relief. And then we come to David and Goliath, 1 Samuel 7, 17, 1-3. The battle lines were drawn between Israel and the Philistines there in the valley of Elah. And this giant of a man, the champion of the Philistines, Goliath of Gath, comes out. It was extraordinary size and strength. The text keeps saying the same thing about what he has. His, his, his bronze greaves, his, his javelin, his, his like a weaver's beam, and all these different things to focus us on the visual of this. And Israel seeing this. And he keeps coming out there and taunting the army. And they're scared to death. Goliath's words defied the God of Israel, but the Israelites were afraid to fight them. Remember what they wanted a king for? To go out and fight their battles. Who ought to be out there fighting Goliath? It ought to be Saul. But he's scared to do it. But the new anointed king will do it, although he's not ruling as king. So Goliath comes out there and basically if we win, you serve us. If you win, we serve you. Of course, they're all afraid. 12-16, through 16, when his older brothers left to fight the Philistines, David remained at home tending his father's sheep. David's still keeping his father's flock. And Jesse's going to send him down there to check on his brothers, check on how things are going, and then that's going to be the opportunity for David. Jesse commanded David to take food to his brothers and their commander and to learn news of the battle. So, in verse 20 through 24, David obeyed his father and arrived at camp in time to hear Goliath taunt the army of Israel. So he hears Goliath say the same words that are read before, or that, or that was said before. And when all the men of Israel, verse 24, saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. But verse 25, the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter. We find out later is not such a great catch after all. And make his father's house free in Israel. That means tax free. And David's like, really? That's what it is? And David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should taunt the armies of the living God. I mean, what's the big... David sees it from a totally different perspective. Now, 
The people answered him in accord with his words, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left these few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. You kind of get an idea there's a history here. Because, I mean, <laughs> what happened? And David said, what have I done now? Was it just a question? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said to the same thing to the people, and they answered the same thing as before. So David's kind of like shocked. You get all this? You get tax-free in Israel if you do this? Samuel 17, 25-26, David learned the reward for killing Goliath and asked the question to make sure he understood. 26b-27, through 27, David based his confident evaluation of the crisis on God's contract with Israel, the uncircumcised Philistine. Eliab assumed the worst about David. And David basically ignored his false accusation. Didn't even give it the time of day. Then he goes before Saul. Word gets around to Saul and he gets David up there and says, you're just a boy. This guy's been a warrior since his youth. And this is when he brings in the lion and the bear. The Lord protected me from the lion and the bear. He will help me from this uncircumcised Philistine. David spoke courageously before Saul and used the Lord's faithfulness as the basis for his confidence. Verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He equates Goliath with the lion and the bear. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Now watch this. Then Saul clothed David with, the gar- with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with, with his armor. And the idea is, just in case this boy wins, they might think it's me. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. He wasn't trained in this. So David took them all. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Now, it's not that... Uh, he didn't know how to use a sling either. He had been very proficient with a sling, and a sling was a good weapon in battle back in those days. They had great slingers who could hit a hare from 100 yards while on a horse. But it wasn't the type of weapon you would bring in battle with a great champion. That's, that's the difference here. So no one expects victory, which is what's important about it, because they're going to know it's of the Lord. Verses 38 and 39, Saul offered David his own armor, but David recognized the foolishness of trying to fight with unfamiliar weapons. So David prepared for battle by arming himself with the simple weapon he was comfortable using. And now let's read from here on out because it's worth checking out what happens. Verse 41, Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? You come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth, check this out, this is why, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Then it happened, when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead. 
so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that, that their champion was dead, they fled, and Israel pursued them. 1 Samuel 17, 41 through 44, Goliath taunted David and made their confrontation a theological issue by cursing David using his gods. Big mistake. Nebuchadnezzar makes that mistake later on. What God is there that can deliver you out of the fiery furnace? Well, he found out. 45 through 47, David based his response, which was an expression of his faith, on his accurate understanding of God's promises to Israel. And he's doing it with the right motivation for God's glory that they will know there is a God in Israel and that the Israelites will know that the Lord still fights for them. 48 through 51, the Holy Spirit inspired few details of the battle, which is normal as we talked about yesterday. It's the conversations around the events more than the event themselves. 52 through 54, the Philistines were beaten. Israel chased the fleeing army. And then David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his weapon in his tent. 55 through 58, Saul wanted to know more of David's background since he just routed Israel's enemy. He asked, you know, who is this, this guy? And it's not so, he knows who he is. David has been playing the harp for him. But it's, what's this guy's background? Who is this young man? What's his background? All that kind of thing. Well, 1 Samuel 18 through 31, we're going to kind of fly through this part. Saul and David engaged in a long conflict. It doesn't take long before Saul gets paranoid over David's success. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 6, it happened as they were coming when David returned from killing the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. rut row. Saul heard that. Then Saul became angry, very angry, for this saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they've ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And this starts the animosity right here. 1 Samuel 18 Jonathan and David enjoyed a special friendship, but Saul's jealousy worsened to the point that he wanted to kill David. And he tries several times. He tries to get him killed by making him go get all these Philistine foreskins and all sorts of different things that take place. And it's, we just don't have time to read through all of it. 1 Samuel 19-20, through 20, Saul continued trying to kill David, but Jonathan's loyalty to David saved him from Saul's wrath. And Jonathan's sort of like the uh, bright spot in all of this. David will actually practice quite a bit of deception. And it's something to watch as you read from 18 onward. Watch David when he deceives and the consequences. And it keeps getting worse until he commits the big one. Normally when we think of David's sin, we think of Bathsheba and murder of Uriah the Hittite. But that's because he'd already set a pattern. Like Abraham... Abraham had an ace in a hole of deception. So does David. And it ramps up. But he's still a man after God's own heart. We'll see why here in a moment. 1 Samuel 21, Doeg, a servant of King Saul, saw David at the tabernacle. David fled to Gath where he deceived Achish, an enemy king, with pretended insanity. There's one of those deceptive aspects. It takes place in, uh, twice in this chapter in that David lied to the priest and then he's basically lying there with uh, King Achash, or the enemy king. And there are consequences in both times when he lies. In 1 Samuel 22, David escaped to the cave of Adullam. Saul executed murderous hatred on the priesthood as Doeg told him what the priests had done to protect David. And it is, Doeg is the one that kills all the priests, 85 men. And you almost have the end of the priesthood, Saul killing the priests. 1 Samuel 23, David sought the Lord for guidance. 
He met with Jonathan for the last time. God used the Philistine attack to save David from Saul. What's interesting is they pass each other, one on one side of the mountain, one on the other side of the mountain. And David is protected by the Lord. And what you have happening is you have David as the anointed king of Israel. But he's not ruling. Not until all his enemies are made a footstool for him, mainly Saul. And it sets a precedent for later on with the Messiah, who is the king, but he's not ruling at this point. But he will rule. So David refused to take Saul's life. He had an opportunity to, to uh, kill the king. And we want to take just slow down just for a second and look at this one. In 24.1, Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. So then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself, take some privacy. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. So Saul, with his chosen soldiers, 3,000, he's gone to try to find David, and he needs a rest stop. Basically what it boils down to. And he just happens to pick one where David and his men are. And watch what the men of David said to him. Verse 4, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. It came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. He could have killed him, but he didn't. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. Note David's perspective. He's not wanting to do anything against the one God has chosen for the king of Israel at this time, even though he's anointed as such. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. So instead of killing Saul while he was relieving himself in a cave, David cut off a piece of his robe. But then David's going to let Saul know. He lets Saul know that he could have killed him. David called after Saul to let him know he had spared his life. Verses 16 through 21. Saul admitted that David was a better man than he and asked David to preserve his descendants, which David, to his ability, will do so, especially with Jonathan's sons. 1 Samuel 24, 22, David acted wisely by promising to remember Saul's descendants. David swore to Saul, and Saul went to his home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. All right, then we have... In 1 Samuel 25, we have the death of Samuel, but also Abigail protected David from a wrong decision. You got this guy named Nabal, who David's men had protected his stuff all winter, basically. And then when they come to kind of collect on the payment that was due, Nabal won't pay, and they get back to David, and he's ready to kill Nabal and everybody. And Abigail gets wind of it, and she stops David from doing something very foolish, and of course, then Nabal has a stroke and dies, and David ends up marrying Abigail. Verse Samuel 26, David spared Saul's life again and chided Abner for his negligence at guard duty. Abner was Saul's you know, secret service guy, and David was able to sneak up, get the spear, could have killed Saul if he wanted to, and so he kind of mocks Abner a little bit. Verse Samuel 26. 1 Samuel 27, David retreated into the land of the Philistines and stayed for 16 months. He even goes down and does some raiding parties down in the south of the Negev there. And then in 1 Samuel 28, since Samuel's not around anymore, Saul commanded the witch of Endor to bring up Samuel so he could ask him advice. The Lord wouldn't answer him. When Saul inquired of the Lord, verse 6, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by the Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. 
And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is in the medium at Endor. Now Saul had outlawed this. And yet, <laughs> it's still going on. And his men know where the one is. So eventually they get there. And in verse 11, the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. And here's what's interesting. Because when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid, but what do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped with a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and did homage. She knows this is the real deal. She's a charlatan, and she knows this is the real deal. Then Samuel said to Saul, I mean, what, what, what have you called me up for? Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am greatly distressed. For number one, the Philistines are waging war against me. Number two, God has departed from me and no longer answers me, either through prophets or by dreams. So, therefore, I have called you, that you may, may make known to me what I should do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me since the Lord has departed from you and has become your adversary? Well, what am I going to tell you? The Lord has done accordingly as he spoke through me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, to David. As you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his fierce wrath on Amalek, so the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So they're, they're going to die, Saul and his sons. 1 Samuel 29 the Philistines prepared for battle against Israel. They sent David back to Ziklag because they don't want David fighting with them. They don't trust him to be with them. 1 Samuel 30, the Amalekites burned the city and took prisoner, but David recovered the people and property. The Amalekites burned the city and took prisoners, but David recovered the people and property. 1 Samuel 31, on Mount Geboa, the Philistines killed Saul and three of his sons, including Jonathan. So it's the loss of David's best friend. All right, we have some contrasts between Saul and David. What was wrong with Saul? Saul was totally self-absorbed and unconcerned about the things of God. It's all about him. Even when Samuel says, it's all over, the Lord has torn the kingdom from you. Well, you know, eh, I messed up. Come on, let's go honor me. We've already built some honors for him in some other places. Saul was indifferent toward, the, toward God. Where was the ark? We don't see him concerned about the ark in any way. Saul disobeyed God. Knowing what to do, as we saw in 1 Samuel 15. But when you look at him from one perspective, he didn't commit adultery. He didn't murder the priest, although not directly. He had somebody else do it. But he doesn't look to be as bad sometimes as David does. What was wrong with Saul? What was right with David? David chose to be God's faithful servant. Doesn't mean he didn't make mistakes. Doesn't mean he didn't sin. But he made consistent choices to be God's faithful servant. David's confidence in God resulted in courage toward man. Saul cowered in his arrogance. David's faith came from his understanding of special revelation, specifically the Abrahamic covenant. We saw that before. This uncircumcised Philistine. He's, he's looking at the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, which is circumcision. David's focus on God's character kept him obedient and enabled him to see life correctly from God's perspective. And an example comes in 2 Samuel. When Nathan comes to David after his sin with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah, tells him the parable story, and David announces judgment. That man ought to die. And Nathan says, well, you the man. 
David doesn't say, well, yeah, but the people, or yeah, but this. He says, you're right, I have sinned. And we get his great confession, Psalm 51, to the Lord, much different than Saul, who always tried to pass the buck, pass the responsibility to someone else. David's focus is much different than Saul's, and that's why he's called a man after God's own heart. All right, so with Samuel, 1 Samuel, we had the book of Transition. With 2 Samuel, we have the book of David's reign. The book of David's reign. By way of introduction, the division of the book, chapters 1 through 4, David's rule over Judah. Chapters 5 through 24, David's rule over all Israel. It takes a little while, I think it's what, seven years before all of Israel is under David. Key people in the book, of course, David the king, Nathan the prophet, Joab, the captain of the guard. There's always something kind of, kind of fishy about Joab. And eventually we find out, because one of the things David tells his son Solomon to do is get rid of Joab, which makes one wonder, why didn't you get rid of Joab? And Absalom, the son who rebelled against David. There's some key people in the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 1, David learned of Saul's death. David learned of Saul's death, and he doesn't rejoice over it. Matter of fact, the guy that finished him off and comes and tells David about it, he has him executed. Because the guy tried to use it as an advantage. In 2 Samuel 2 through 5, David secured the throne and captured Jerusalem. There's some things that happen that bring up some red flags with Joab and Abner, some other things. But then once he gets the throne secure, the first thing we find David wanting to do is move the ark. David moved the ark of God to Jerusalem, demonstrating his concern for God's name or character. In 2 Samuel 6, Verse 1, Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baalai Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. Now the problem is, that was not how you moved the ark. You moved the ark with the poles through the rings. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. He touches it. He grabs it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. And he didn't mean anything by it. He actually thought he was doing something that needed to be done. And he touches what God has said not to touch. And David became angry because the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. We start seeing more red flags in David's life. Before, in chapter 5, he took more concubines. Here he gets angry with the Lord. He gets over it. But it's working itself up to that crescendo of when he commits the big sin. So you have the moving of the ark. They eventually get it in as they move it correctly. And then we're going to slow down right here at 2 Samuel 7 with the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. And this, again, is an expansion of the seed paragraph of the Abrahamic covenant. The Davidic covenant was a contract made by God with David to establish the eternal Davidic dynasty, ensuring that someone from David's family will rule forever. 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 17, 1 Chronicles 17, 10 through 15. We're probably doing some flipping here in a minute between some of these. Now, what prompts this is David says, well, we've got the ark here, and I'd like to build a temple, a house for the Lord. And he tells Nathan that. 
And Nathan says, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And then Nathan goes home. The Lord says, no, he's not going to do it. But you go back and tell him this. And so this is where the Davidic covenant comes into. Verse 8, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. And the house here is a dynasty. That's what's coming for David. The Davidic covenant was an expansion of the seed paragraph promise of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, land, seed, and blessing of Genesis chapter 12. So this is an expansion of the second paragraph. The provisions of the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, 11 and 16. Verse Chronicles 17, 10. God promised an eternal house for David. The word house refers to a dynasty or a family line of kings. 1 Samuel 17, 10, Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue your enemies, more I tell you that the Lord will build a house for you. You, almost, you have some very similar verbiage in Samuel and Chronicles, but there's also some differences. 2 Samuel 7, 12, A son of David, Solomon, would sit on the throne after David. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. That's going to be Solomon. This is the near aspect of the prophecy. 1 Kings 1 shows God working behind the scenes through Bathsheba and Nathan to secure the throne of Solomon because he has a brother that's trying to, to get it from him. The fulfillment of this near prophecy in their day proves God will fulfill the far prophecy someday in the future. And the far prophecy is with the Messiah, the greater son of David. Also, Solomon literally sat on the literal throne of his father David. Since God fulfilled the near prophecy literally, he also will literally fulfill the far prophecy. You cannot know prophecy is fulfilled without a literal fulfillment. Just like you can't know what's being said without a literal interpretation. 2 Samuel 7, 13, Solomon would be the one to build God's temple. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Second Samuel 7, 13 and 16, God established David and Solomon's throne forever. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. God did not establish Solomon himself forever, but the throne he occupied. The rulership, if you will. God cut off Solomon from the Messianic line. We have the curse of Kenai in Jeremiah twenty-two thirty-six. Remember, Joseph is the descendant of Solomon. Mary is the descendant of Nathan. If, if from the line of Joseph, then Jesus is not qualified to sit on the throne if he's genetically connected directly to Joseph, with Joseph being his father because of the curse of Kaniah. 2 Samuel seven fourteen and 15, God would discipline Solomon for disobedience, but his loving kindness would continue. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, it's got to be about Solomon, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. So Solomon's going to get to live out his life. First Chronicles 17, 11, Messiah would come from David's seed. When your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. 
Messiah's throne, house, and kingdom will be established forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took it from him who was before you. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. In Chronicles, you have a focus on Messiah. In 2 Samuel, you've got to focus on Solomon. And there's a reason for that because of Chronicles being written after the return to the land of Israel. In Chronicles with David, you do not have David painted in a bad light at all in Chronicles. And when it comes to 2 Chronicles, which parallels 1 and 2 Kings, they never talk about the northern kingdom. It's about the southern kingdom. Because that's the line in which David, the line of David, and the line of which Messiah is going to come. So it, it has this focus on the coming of the Messiah. It has a different purpose for writing. The rule of the Davidic throne was tied to Israel being in the promised land and obeying the Lord. Psalm 132, 11 and 12. The Lord has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body I will set up your throne. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony which I will teach them, their sons also shall sit up, shall, 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 got my merge wixed. Their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his habitation. 1 Kings 2, 1 and 4. David spoke to Solomon for the last time. And this is what he says. If I can get there. 1 Kings 2, verse 1. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon with his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out His promise which He spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Of course, they didn't do that. So right now, there's not a man on the throne of Israel. But there will be. Jesus Christ is not sitting on the throne of David. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. The throne of David is something different. Second Chronicles 7, 17-22. God appeared at Solomon at night to ask him for whatever he wanted. And when he asked him, Solomon was asking for wisdom. We'll see that again in a minute. God's unconditional promises about the house, throne, and kingdom were based, again, as we said, on the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis 17, 6, God promised that kings and nations would come from Abraham. The Davidic covenant focused on God's chosen nation and chosen king. So, again, the Abrahamic covenant, land, seed, and blessing... Real estate covenant expanded in Deuteronomy 29 through 30 for the land. The seed paragraph expanded in the Davidic covenant where we are right now. And later on, the new covenant expands the blessing part of the contract. No amount of disobedience from Abraham's or David's descendants can change the contract. Now for it to be brought into fruition... There's going to be obedience. But God's not going to undo the contract. They're going to, uh, the Israel that's left at the end of the great time of Jacob's trouble will believe in Messiah. And he will come and then fulfill all these things. Psalm 89, 20 through 37 confirmed God's promises. Psalm 89. 20 through 37 confirmed God's promises. Verse 19, once you spoke in vision to your godly ones and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. God chose David. Verse 20, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him. The servant and anointed. 
with him, whom my hand will be established, my arm also will be strengthened him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him, but I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him, and in my name his horn will be exalted. The strong one from his loins will be exalted. This is looking to the greater son of David. Now in verse 25, I shall set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He will cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So here you have that term firstborn applied. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. It's going to be eternal. So you have a shift in the sun and moon are witnesses to the promise, according to Jeremiah 33 and Jeremiah 31. Whoops. Witnesses is the word. That ought to be down in the bottom. The sun and the moon are the witnesses to this. All right, quickly, let's get the New Testament connection here, and then we'll take, take a break. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greater son of David. Both Matthew and Luke identified Jesus as the son of David. As we noted before, with Matthew's genealogy, Matthew 1, 1 through 17, Matthew focused on Jesus as the king, providing his lineage from Abraham. Jesus as the king. The genealogy of Luke 3, 23 through 31, Luke focused on Jesus as the perfect man, providing his lineage all the way back to Adam. The two lines are identical from Abraham to David but then split into two different sons of David, Nathan and Solomon. We saw that earlier when we were looking at Rahab in being in that genealogy. Matthew 1.11, Matthew continued the line through Solomon leading to the legal father of Jesus, that is, Joseph. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers in the time of the deportation of Babylon. When you get there, you've got the Keniah curse, so this is why, again, he's, he's cut off. There will no longer be a man from his loins to sit on the throne. The rest of these are not kings. Luke 3.31, Luke continued through Nathan leading to Mary, the biological mother of Jesus' humanity. She's not the mother of God. She is the mother of the humanity of Christ. The virgin birth not only prevented the Messiah from being born with a sin nature, but also avoided the Kaniah curse of Solomon's line. I keep mentioning that. We're not reading the passage. I'm going to read it real quick. In Jeremiah 22, verse 30. Thus says the Lord, Write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. So he's not going to have any one of his descendants sitting on the throne. In Jeremiah 36, verse 30, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. Verification, Jesus is the son of David. Luke 1, 30-33, Gabriel's announcement verified that Mary's son would fulfill the Davidic covenant. When Gabriel comes to Mary, he says to her, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Matthew 9, 27, Blind men knew that Jesus was the Son of David. And Matthew does that to show that the Pharisees who can see can't recognize it. There are two blind men that cry out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Romans 1, 1 1-14, Paul emphasized that Jesus, the promised son of David, fulfilled the promises of the Davidic covenant. So even in his intro to the Romans, Paul emphasizes this. We'll start with verse 3. Concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Who was declared the son of God with power of the resurrection from the dead. 
Revelation 3.7, the key passed to David. Isaiah 22.22, the key, the emblem of authority over David's house was passed from Shebna to Eliakim there in Isaiah. And now we have it, the authority in the person of Jesus Christ. Revelation 22.16, the root and offspring of David. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The root, Jesus Christ, existed before David, emphasizing his eternality, the eternality of Messiah. The offspring, Jesus Christ, was born a descendant of David, fulfilling the promise of an eternal king in David's line. Let's, let's, let's two more minutes here. Get, go ahead and get through to this, to 2 Samuel 8. The precise nature of the prophecy guarantees that Israel will be preserved. Israel must have a national existence. Jews must live in the land as a nation for these things to be fulfilled in the Davidic covenant. Messiah's reign on David's throne is a major piece of the puzzle for Israel's final restoration with this greater son of David. In no way is Christ fulfilling the reign of David at the present time. It's, no, it's not this kingdom now, not yet. So, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know the number on that. I can get it, but not right now. Okay. Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That hadn't happened yet. The Lord will stretch, your, stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. It hasn't happened yet. David's son will return to earth to rule on David's throne. Again, he will have the throne of his father David for all eternity. The kingdom established at the return of Christ will be eternal. The first phase of it will be the millennium. Christ will continue to rule right past the millennium, although we're going to get rid of this present earth in its form, get a new heavens and a new earth. Christ's return to establish His reign will bring in the millennial kingdom as prophesied in Revelation 19.20. That's the only time we get the number on it. But the Old Testament is filled with it. And if you don't have a literal kingdom, you've got to allegorize the interpretation of those verses. And that gets into huge problems. Christ will rule from Jerusalem. Jeremiah 3, 17, Zechariah 14, 16. Christ's rule will extend over Israel. And there's some connection, and a resurrected David is even going to rule. I think this is the passage where it's in. Ezekiel 37, 21. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it. They and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be the prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them and will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. That's all new covenant language. The time of Ezekiel's writing, they're out of the land. They've been exiled. So this is looking to something future that has not happened yet. Christ's rule will extend beyond Israel to all the nations of the earth. <laughs> Under Messiah. So this chart, just real quick, we've got the Abrahamic covenant. This follows the timeline down here when it was formed. Mosaic covenant during the time of Moses setting up the theocracy, the land covenant, what we're looking at here in the Davidic covenant, time of the monarchy. The new covenant, which is announced in Hosea and then starts getting unpacked a little bit, carries over in the time of Jeremiah. 
with restoration to the land in the sense of the return under Ezra and Nehemiah, the building of the second temple, come to the time of Christ. The law comes to an end fulfilled in Christ, and there's a, there's a new entity coming. The kingdom is rejected by Israel, so the postponement of the kingdom, not the removal, but the postponement until a future time in between we have what we call the church, the time of the New Testament. In the time of the kingdom, all of these will be brought into fulfillment. Remember, this one is fulfilled in Christ. All of it is fulfilled through Christ. And in some aspect, the church has some similarities with things in the New Covenant. So we have just kind of a, a small line going into this from the New Covenant line. But it's, all of this will be fulfilled. Abrahamic covenant in its three paragraphs completely in a future time when Messiah will rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. All right, let's stop right there.